Hi, and welcome to Thoughts for Today and Words for the Week for Sunday, August the 16th. Is Jesus' ministry going to the dogs? A superficial reading of the text, Matthew chapter 15, verses 21 through 28, would, would give you that impression. I consider this story a, a soul teaser. It's often designated as one of the hard teachings of Jesus. But in the end, it is a reminder of the inclusiveness of the gospel, irrespective of who one is or where one has come from, which is really, really good news for all of us. Let us pray. O oh God, source of all beauty and goodness, your grace comes fresh every day. And every day you give us light and life and love, and you bring us together now from a variety of walks of life, experiences, hopes, dreams, challenges, and triumphs. So Lord, in this time, we pray now that your spirit would bring us, each one of us, strength, that your word would guide us, your word direct us, your love satisfy our needs, and show us the way to follow you, and that your promises would fill us with hope. In the name of Jesus, our Lord, we pray. Amen. I would invite you to pause at this point and go grab your Bible, and uh, that way you could follow along with uh, the reading of Matthew chapter 15, verses 21 through 28. Matthew 15, 21 through 28. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. Let us pray. In this quiet time, God of peace, we come. We come to speak to you with our hearts and with our souls from the depths of our being. And these prayers come not just as prayers that we voice aloud, but also as prayers of faith that come from who we are and what we seek to do as we reflect your life and love in our lives as we journey through life, touching those who cross our path. Lord, we pray to just be better followers and disciples of Jesus. We pray that uh, we would be folks that can bless others with the blessings that we've received from you. This day, oh Lord, we lift up to, those, up to you those who uh, struggle with the pandemic, we pray for those who must seclude themselves because of health issues or age, uh, or those who are exposed day in and day out to the virus by virtue of the work that they do. We pray, O oh Lord, for all of those on the front line, those who test, those who diagnose, those who administer care in the hospital. We pray for the families that are separated of the need for isolation. And Lord, as we're praying this day, we ask that uh, you would give us strength and forbearance to show in these days love, especially when we're weighed down, especially when new and different kinds of demands are placed upon us, upon the way we live and the way we interact with, with one another. And Lord, most of all, we would pray that you would allow love and help love and not fear rule the day. Lord, we pray for this world which you have lovingly made. Animals, great and small, who make our lives interesting, people of the earth, all nations and tribes, nationalities and languages. 
not to say also sizes, shapes, and colors. With all of our diversity and commonality, we, we just lift them up to you, O oh Lord. We lift up to you those in our world who weep and those who cause them to weep. For those without food, without clothing, without shelter, without means of sustaining life with dignity. We pray, O oh Lord, for those who distort the news, those who distort the good news of the gospel. We pray for those who make gods out of things or out of themselves or out of institutions and systems and structures. Lord, we pray for those who live without meaning and hope. We pray for those who live as objects of the whims of others. And for those who live in broken families, broken communities, and yes, even a broken world. Tender and compassionate friend, give us the assurance that you are with us wherever we are and whatever we're facing, but especially now in these moments where we take time out deliberately in terms of quiet and rest in order to hear a word from you. These are our prayers that we offer in the name and spirit of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Growing up, we never had a dog in our house. Uh, dogs were outside animals, and uh, most of the time the dogs that we were around were dogs at my grandparents, and they tended to live under the house. In fact, a lot of dogs lived under the house out in the rural areas in central Texas. The first in-house dog is the dog that we have now. She's been with us for about three years. Katie is her name. Katie was dumped at uh, Deer Brookdale Plaza. And when she first came home to be with us, she was pretty skittish around me. It was pretty obvious that uh, she'd been abused, abused by guys. And so she didn't really want to have anything to do with me. In fact, as I would approach her, she would run away. She wouldn't even let me pet her. But slowly but surely, she became, we became, she became, we became friends just because, well, I would give her treats, pieces of bread, pieces of pizza crust, uh, anything to kind of coax her into knowing that uh, I, was, I was her friend and, and I tried to be very gentle with her. Today, it's not uncommon for Katie to sit between us when we're eating a meal and it's not uncommon for me to slip her something every now and then. And that's how we maintain our friendship. Puppy dogs and breadcrumbs. It's part of the storyline of today's scripture. Scholars, preachers, and many readers of this text scratch their heads because they're just puzzled, bumfuzzled about this topic of, 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 of Jesus talking to this lady in, in a way that seems to be derogatory. Uh, this passage has been a passage, uh, a point of conversation all week long with uh, a couple of other pastors. What are we to make of Jesus' initial response to this woman that seems so rude? Um, what are we to make of the disciples who seem so cold? What are we to make of the early Matthean community of faith for which the story was initially preserved? Was something missing in their uh, way of dealing with others? And what does it say to us? to you and to me today. As I've already mentioned, I think this text, this story is, is really kind of like a soul teaser um, in that it, it, it grabs your attention, it, it pulls you in, it makes you think, meditate about it. Uh, all through the course of this week, I've, I've spent time contemplating what does this text mean and how does it play out in my life and in the lives of, of folks that are around me and, and as I share with you today. Um, Jesus is in a foreign territory for sure. He's, he's out of bounds. He's out of uh, uh, the network that he's grown up in. Um, the Canaanites, the place where he's at, uh, is, is territory that's been overtaken by the Israelites. And so they're not on exactly good terms. They haven't been for generations. Uh, for generations now, there's been this animosity between the Israelites and, and uh, Canaanites. So was Jesus being rude or was he just simply stating facts about uh, 
what was what he had heard and what he had seen as as <clears throat> as he had lived in the life of the life in the community of an Israelite. Um, was Jesus rude though, though, in terms of the silent treatment and then kind of just then actually referring to her as a, as a dog? Was he kidding with the woman? Or maybe did Jesus need to out, uh, adjust his mission to, to outsiders? And the disciples so annoyed, uh, they really just want her out of sight and then therefore out of mind. And you have to almost chuckle, 12 guys can't send uh, a woman away, they need Jesus to do that for them. And then the Canaanite woman, what's her story? Is she a single mom? She obviously has some understanding of who Jesus is, if only by virtue to address him as Lord and, and Son of David. And certainly we can understand a mom's desperation when it comes to a child. Uh, well, Parents will do almost anything. And in this case, she actually kneels down asking for mercy. It becomes more and more personal and emotional. And so does she and her daughter matter to Jesus, to the disciples, to God? These are the questions. Both the Canaanite woman and Jesus live and operate out of their social, cultural, ethnic, and religious upbringings and context, along with their own barriers and prejudices that, that take place because the animosity has been going on so long among these people. Jesus is coming from his Israelite Jewish background. The Canaanite woman is coming from her Gentile background. As I've mentioned, the culture of the day uh, for Jesus, they saw Gentiles as, as, as pagans, as uh, enemies, and basically writes them off as, as dogs, street dogs. Why? Because it's just a way of being derogatory, and we even call people dogs today or situations, boy, this is, this is, this is a dog. So when Jesus says to take children's food and throw it to the dogs, he's basically reminding this woman of a prevalent attitude among, among his people. But when the Canaanite woman says, but even the dogs eat crumbs from under the table, she's witty for sure, but her sense of dogs is, is a household pet. For the record, at this point, healing the sick, casting out demons, raising the dead, giving sight to the blind and a voice to the mute, Jesus is, has been and is ministering to, to the people of Israel. But Jesus also heals a Roman centurion's servant. We'll read this in, in Matthew chapter 8, verse 5. And uh, the story of the centurion's servant being healed is is, is once again Jesus stepping outside the bounds of, of his Jewishness, of being an Israelite. But now this Canaanite woman comes along, confronting Jesus head on in a loud voice, have mercy on me, my daughter is tormented by a demon. And given what we know of Jesus and see of him thus far, uh, we would expect Jesus, no questions asked, no no, nothing barred to, to keep him from healing this woman's daughter. For it seems to be unfolding just like uh, the story of the centurion's servant. But it's here that we're blindsided. First, there's the silent treatment. Jesus doesn't even respond or acknowledge her. And for all intents and purposes, Jesus basically, basically is ignoring her. Disciples take Jesus' silence as an opportunity to express their desire. Hey, let's just let's just shoo her out of the way, brush her off, ignore her request. She's just a screaming woman, an emotional mom, with probably the underlying thought: Hey, we're in foreign territory, and she's not one of us, and we're not one of them. Jesus did, of course defines his primary responsibility as being uh, his initial charge to the house of Israel. Uh, 
And it's then that the Canaanite woman who comes to Neil simply says, Lord, help me. And the conversation turns to puppy dogs and breadcrumbs. It's not fair to take children's food and throw it to the dogs. I have to admit, my sympathies lie with the Canaanite woman. She is simply who she is by no choice of her own. She can't help it. She knows she's an outsider when it comes to the Israelites, and she knows she's an outsider when she's coming to Jesus. But lest we forget, uh, Jesus' humanity is, is defined by his lineage as well. He is an Israelite. He is a Jew. And I would remind you that Jesus has Canaanite, or let's say Gentile, blood flowing in his veins as well. Four of his grandmothers are Gentiles. Actually, great-grandmothers, great-great-grandmothers in the lineage, Rahab a Canaanite, Tamar, a Canaanite, Ruth, a Moabite, Bathsheba, a Hittite. These are the ladies, these are the women, these are the grandmamas that are, that, whose lives and blood flow through Jesus' lineage. But it's then that the woman comes with a certain amount of boldness and says to Jesus, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And it's her faith that grabs Jesus' attention. She's willing to take the crumbs, the leftovers, which was even a concern for Jesus, for Jesus when he fed the 5,000. And there was 12 baskets left over. He had the disciples pick up uh, the leftovers. So Jesus knows about, about crumbs. And so I begin to hear Israelite lives matter. Canaanite lives matter. Gentile lives matter. That's you and me, you know. We're Gentiles too. And quite honestly, you always have been. The witness of Scripture, and in this case, particularly the book of Matthew, underscores this theme of, of connecting with Gentiles. Remember uh, the Christmas story, the story of the wise men, the Magi coming? Gentiles. And these are the ones who offer gold, frankincense and myrrh, and perhaps those were sold and used in order to get Jesus to safety in Egypt. And then there's the ending of Matthew, where Jesus says to the 11, the 11 go, and make, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. This soul, te this soul teaser teaches me, reminds me that if I can empathize with the Canaanite woman, if there's a tug in my heart, then I can empathize with those who are outside of the life of faith, those who are in need, those who carry burdens and hurts that are not of their own making, but hurt nonetheless. The soul teaser also underscores that we are all someone's Canaanite, little puppies in that we don't fit or belong due to others. Blind spots of prejudice, hatred, anger, pride, ego, snobbery. And that should give us a sense of empathy and connectedness to a lot of folks around us. None of us, none of us can do very much about our pedigree, who we are, who we were born to, where we were born, who has had a part of our lineage, all these things that play into our lives. None of us can do very much about how we've grown up, what experiences we've had, indeed how, how our pedigree is, is played out. And even Jesus seems to have had all these sorts of things going against him as he was being considered the Messiah, coming from a small town, a small hick town from nowhere, a son of a carpenter, four Gentile women in his lineage. All to say that uh, this soul te teaser underscores 
and reminds us that if we can empathize with this woman, we can empathize with the folks that are around us whose pedigrees are different from our own, that we can care, that we can be a difference, that we can love, that we can, like the Canaanite woman, be tenacious about inclusiveness and tenacious about the fact that underdogs' lives matter, yours and mine and everyone else's. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the woman who so desperately needed her child healed and wouldn't let go, wouldn't give up, wouldn't give in, even when she was discouraged or could have been discouraged. Lord, we pray that uh, we might have that kind of faith to be tenacious, to hang on, to hold on uh, when things seem to be going against us. But we also pray, oh Lord, that we can uh, uh, be the kind of people of faith that uh, empathize with those around us who are who are hurting in ways and just by virtue of who they are where they've come from what they don't have uh, what they may even have in order to be a blessing to them lord hear our prayers in the name of your son amen the lord bless you and keep you the lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you the lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace Amen.